Hello. Hello to the people arriving. Hi. Oh, great. Okay, I'll get started. Hello, everyone joining. Um, welcome. Uh, this is the first in conversation in a new series um, that I'll be doing for Athena Art Foundation. And Athena is a new not-for-profit digital platform promoting engagement with pre-modern art. Uh, its main platform is its website, uh, which is a hub which presents innovative digital content about exhibitions or podcasts and other resources. Um, and it also creates original content, um, and I'm really excited to be uh, part of that with this interview series. And my first guest um, is the wonderful Michael Diaz Griffith. And Michael is an art and antiques expert, but possibly more importantly, he's an art and antiques lover. And throughout his really diverse career, he has expressed this sort of passion and love in many different forms. He's currently the executive director of the Sone Museum Foundation, which runs events and initiatives and fundraising projects for the Sir John Sone Museum in London. And he's previously worked at the Winter Show, to which he's still uh, very much uh, involved, um, which is the foremost antiques fair in New York. And he was um, the sort of visionary behind uh, Young Collectors Night, creating space for young collectors in a field that is predominantly uh, dominated by the older generation. He also co-hosted a podcast, Curious Objects, alongside Benjamin Miller for a long time, and founded the New Antiquarians. And we're going to be talking about all of these uh, different things. Um, and, but what we'll be focusing on is this idea of collecting whether it's historic collections and our perceptions, both correct and incorrect, uh, about these sort of museums and collections, um, but also about our modern engagement with art and antiques, both the problems and changes that Michael sees with accessibility and with this interest amongst younger audiences. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna add Michael to the chat. Okay. All right. Hello. Hi there. Thank you for that very kind and generous introduction. <laughs> oh, I wasn't able to touch on half the things that I, I had. I had a sort of bullet point list of all the things I thought I, I could say, but tried to make it short and sweet. And then there's a lot for, for us to dig into. Um, Absolutely. Are you well? Where, where do we find you right now? I'm well and, and healthy in New York City. Um, the Sohn Foundation is based in America, which is uh, a detail that is sort of hard to wrap your head around, but there are reasons for it. And um, I miss London a lot and I can't wait to get back, but I know we'll see each other in person one day soon, somehow. For sure, for sure. Well, we, we, uh, we need to have you back in London. Not that I'm actually in London right now. I'm in, I'm in Spain, but um, you know, when I'm back in London, we need to. You know, there's a Michael Diaz Griffith shaped hole uh, in the city. <laughs> we'll have a pint. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I need to get to New York pretty soon. Um, great. So I kind of wanted to start off. There's so many different things that I want to touch on and talk about. But I kind of wanted to start off with just asking your kind of origin story and how you, <laughs> to put it that way, or like how you first got involved or engaged with arts and antiques. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of people, I found myself fascinated by, you know, historic objects, art, architecture from a young age, but I didn't really have anything to sort of hang that interest on. You know, I'm from Alabama and there are no art historians in my family. Um, there is an antiques dealer. My maternal grandmother uh, was an antiques dealer. And I talked about that on Curious Objects. You might have seen that episode. Um, sorry, there's a, a buzz in my... Yeah, yeah. But she she was not working at the, the level of the market that you and I deal in now. <laughs> so I didn't have access to that in any way. I was just I just loved old things. I dragged my parents to house museums. I studied on my own. And it wasn't until college that I had a sense of, you know, how all of this could sort of coalesce into a career. Um, but even then, you know, I was really propelled to 
conduct my studies in an in a formal atmosphere and i was always being drawn towards philosophy or literature you know sort of other disciplines that sort of compete with art history proper you know in academia um for kind of like space in in intellectual culture and long story short at a certain point i just decided a phd wasn't for me i wanted to be out in the world and in the sort of hurly burly of the market which i was coming to to learn about and that's when i started working for art fairs and and the rest is history so i sort of i have like a footing in the academic world but i also betrayed it in some ways for the sort of excitement of um the fray yeah it's okay yeah. i think we can forgive you for that <laughs> you know? I, i may come back some day and and finish that phd but in the meantime it's fun to to do things like this and talk about yeah. objects you know just as an everyday part of our lives that anyone can learn about objects in any context yeah. so it's just slight side side note but it's funny that your that your what did you say your maternal grandmother or your paternal grandmother was an antique my ma maternal grandmother and i yeah and the story that i've told is that she her version of retirement was taking all of her material on the road in a pink tractor trailer and she sort of lived out of it i mean i i'm from the deep south so this is not <laughs> no pretensions here she literally lived out of this tractor trailer and then when she died my mom inherited that and she loathed antiques at that point because she had always been subjected to you know living in stuffy spaces that were sort of that doubled as her mother's shop yeah. i think i mentioned before like even the kitchen was was interpreted as an historic kitchen and so my mother had to eat sort of vienna sausages and other like canned foods in the corner because it wasn't for use and so long story short she got rid of all of those antiques and i grew up in a in an atmosphere that absolutely lacked any kind of historical character so mm -hmm. you know it's things skip a generation and also you sort of want what you don't have and yeah. uh I I certainly wanted more history in my life. It is it is it is funny though because so I didn't know this about your grandma but my paternal grandfather was an antiques dealer in a kind wow. of wow uh, route like in in rural Yorkshire and I don't again don't have art kind of parents although they're both very they you know both interested and 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 engaged in it but they weren't kind of in in the art world um but I don't know is there something like slightly slightly wired with that <laughs> that just like is oh historic object let's be let's be drawn let's be drawn down towards that i know I, it's uh, one to think on yeah, um yeah. yeah so not taking the academic route you then went was it was your first stop the winter show or did you did you have some other stops along the way no um a notable stop that really connects to the london context is the the hotton families fairs and mm. specifically the new york one Um so that was my introduction to these rich dynamic sort of cross collecting fairs as as they're kind of known now and I absolutely loved everything about that context so that that's what held me in the fair world um yeah and what kind of what kind of roles did you slot into because obviously you'd, you'd had a uh, the the academic foundations quite strongly and we and we sort mm. of spoke about that of wanting you know seeking out for yourself this this rigorous training which i think is is so often connected with you know elite worlds and with having a having a family background in that mm -hmm. but actually just wanting that kind of um you know that that really deep kind of rigorous training in that and so what did that what did what were you then using that for or how did that translate i started at the very bottom i started as an intern and I'll, and actually anyone who wants to make their way in the art world usually has to sort of suck it up at some point and accept that you're going to do grunt work it's not always going to be glamorous and you have to sort of come through this initiation period <laughs> in which you're willing to do everything maybe i distinguished myself by knowing about the material i mean not everyone in fair world actually understands what they're looking at i'm not saying that in a critical way right but it's kind of like show business So a lot of people who are running fairs are are coming from the world of events and production. Mm -hmm. So maybe that was an advantage. Um but you know one of the things I learned very quickly is that dealers are one some of the most interesting people on the planet. And two 
they know just as much or more about historic art and material culture as curators. And I don't say that in a way that's critical of curators, but I think often people's expectations of what dealers know are mm -hmm. sort of informed by cynicism about the market. And I just couldn't find, you know, I, I passionately adore dealers and their knowledge. And I think they're so critical to surfacing not only new material, but new knowledge that mm -hmm. then gets sort of, you know, deepened and extrapolated in museum contexts. But so much of it comes from, you know, these people who kind of also chose a different path at some point. Maybe they also dropped out of their PhD programs. Maybe they were born into a family of dealers, but I just find, yeah, dealers in their world to be yeah. really special. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And, you know, you meet people and the level of, of the sort of the, the depth of knowledge and passion and, and the types of objects you've seen. I mean, you know, working as I previously did at the, the Wallace Collection, Everything is kind of the, the the skim on the top of the on the top of the cream, you know. It's the absolute creme de la creme, you know. It's the it's the it's the top notch. And in some ways, that means you're. Le I mean, in many ways, that means you're less well informed because if you're only looking at the best things, there isn't any sense of how how that compares the other the you know the other knowledge that is needed. And so often, um, something that I was always so uh, so impressed by and was my first kind of exposure to was the ways in which the curators, you know, the more senior curators at the Wallace, I was like, as, say, grunt work, but, you know, the, the more senior curators had been there a long time, had these really long established relationships with the art oh, yes. and with the dealers uh, for sharing of knowledge, you know, and having these yeah. amazing kind of research object handling sessions where you'd have these these sort of world experts in, in the dealer side. Mm -hmm. and going through. Yeah. And at that level, there's almost, you know, the curator's best friends and spouses are dealers and vice versa. So you're right. I mean, there's incredible sort of fluidity between these worlds that isn't somehow acknowledged up front. Mm -hmm. But once you've, once you've dug in, you really see it. And that's, you know, also kind of characterized my career trajectory because I've been able to move back and forth a bit. And um, I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. Is that similar in, in New York? Is there a similar relationship between the market and the and the museums? I just don't know the the world well enough in New York to know. Yeah, there is. And I mean, I'd say that there's there's a really strong continuum from from the market through, you know, the world of collectors and museum trustees to the to the world of, of you know, curatorial practice in all of its expressions. Um, but certainly you know, senior curators and senior dealers are, are sort of a part of the same network. And mm -hmm. I think that any, you know, when any young person can access any part of that network, it will enrich mm -hmm. their lives and their experience of, of the art world. Yeah. yeah. And as much as, well, well, something I wanted to ask you about is when you arrived on the scene, what was it, what was it like in terms of, you know, in terms of the age group? I mean, a lot of the stuff that you've done, a lot of the work you've done has been really uh, geared towards getting younger people engaged in yeah. objects and feeling comfortable in fairs and you know engaging with objects in a mm -hmm. sort of in a non-excluding sense in an accessible sense and so i wondered yeah. how was that when you started and how do you see it to have changed i i think that the art world was really slow to adapt to the sort of digital revolution and so even though my career in the art world began sort of well after the advent of social media, et cetera. It was still very, it was still a new concept and there was still quite a bit of resistance to the digital world um, in the sort of part of the market that these fairs are engaged with. And so when I began, I think we were on the other side of a watershed that has since occurred mm -hmm. in which um, there were certainly some visionaries who understood that the internet and social media were going to be sort of the future of all markets and of all disciplinary fields. But there was also a lot of resistance, even to just posting on Instagram. You know, there, there, a, a feeling that an object was almost denigrated by the medium itself. And I think that um, a lot of my early work was about trying to overcome that resistance and now looking back, it's almost, it feels like a part of history. Like this idea that 
people would resist even showing material online. I mean, there are market-based reasons to hold back an, uh, you know, material, um, and, but I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the bare condition of like not wanting for things to be seen mm. online for, for like almost spiritual reasons. And now some of those people are the most active Instagram users mm -hmm. I know. They spend 100% of their time seemingly on Instagram and love it. And of course, business is conducted through social media, you know, channels now. But I think just kind of like when I lived in London, I didn't have internet. When I lived in Mexico City, I didn't have internet. And when we moved to New York, I really didn't want it again. I found it really nice to live at home in a kind of like pure zone unfettered by technology. But I quickly saw like, I'm the younger person in this room. I'm going to have to be the one that represents this perspective. And so I kind of <laughs> took it on because it was inevitable. And also I was, you know, became sort of passionate about opening up that side of the market as much as I could to new possibilities. At the same time, I want to be really clear that like, whenever we discuss trends or patterns, there's, there's a way in which these things can be like plotted diachronically on a historic uh, line. But some of these things are just structural and every institution is always grappling with like how online it wants to be, et cetera. Yes. So anyway, I mean, I think that these conversations are still happening. But a couple of years ago, it was very different. And I, I'd say like two to three years ago, we really reached a watershed in which everyone understood, like, we're just going to be online. And that's how it is. Yeah. Um, which changed the nature of my work. So now it's more just about communicating through this medium that we all are on. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I experienced exactly the same thing with, you know, starting to use Instagram and there being a real pushback. And, um, in, and you know, those same people who are pushing back were then you know, as you say, then then say, oh, everyone who works in this field now has to have an Instagram account. I'm like, oh, well, six months ago. <laughs> Precisely. Pulling me out for this, uh, you know, this platform. It's so funny how these how these things are kind of changing and adapting. And I think particularly with the with the lockdown so much in the art world, well, everything in the art world has had to go online. I mean, how has that how has that affected your work in terms of, you know, the fairs and things like that? How's that kind of translated with the lockdown? Oh gosh, so now I sit on the steering committee of the Winter Show and I'm also involved in Masterpiece London. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been able to observe, you know, quite quietly from my perch in the nonprofit sort of museum side now, what's been happening. And I think that, you know, fairs are innately physical events. And so there's always going to be a loss when you don't have the experience of serendipitously wandering the aisles and having social interactions. But I think fairs have done the best job they can in trying to translate that experience into something engaging online. Is it the most dynamic way of engaging with the material? No. And so I think that, you know, in some ways, like Instagram, it's is still more engaging as a sort of digital experience of art and objects than any kind of website e-commerce setting. Mm. I, I think, you know, online auctions have done very well during the pandemic. And I think that's a very exciting context to engage in because, because it's, while they're not directly social, you're kind of competing against others. Mm. And I know a lot of collectors were sort of sitting at home in their garden and online auctions were their hobby. And so yeah. uh, you, you would have seen this as well, you know, prices started going up. There was more competition around material that had not necessarily uh, been at that, you know, competitive at that level just a year before, but it was because people were having fun. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, you know, fairs are fun. They have to be fun. The minute they begin feeling like a chore, something is going wrong. And so anyway, I, th I think anything online that can like provoke that sense of serendipity, mm -hmm. fun, com competitiveness, uh, romance is, is a good thing and has yeah. to be explored more. Yeah. And in terms of the sort of ways in which you see engagement around younger people having changed, because, you know, we're talking about online, but online is not just synonymous with young people, you know, <laughs> loads of different people are online, and loads of different people are, are doing online auctions. But in terms of, 
you know, the, the younger initiatives? I mean, how do you see the both like the barriers and also the kind of perception of non-existent barriers to entry with collecting? I mean, where do you, where do you kind of stand with that? Yeah. I mean, there are challenges both on the side of the traditional market and among younger people. And I can sort of address both. When I was, my, my stance on, on younger people collecting, the sort of baseline observation is that it is completely inaccurate to say that young people are not interested in history or that they're not interested in complexity, color, pattern, etc. And there are all of these myths that get repeated that like, all young people are minimalists or that they shop at Ikea. And something I probably go on about too much is that I think that um, that's really an analysis of the market in the 90s and in the early 2000s. I mean, there was a really strong shift after the 80s towards mid-century modern minimalism, you know, the sort of revival of interest in a lot of mid-century art, including ABEX. And so there was a turn and it really impacted, I think, Gen X. So, you know, the generation above between millennials and baby boomers. And that has continuing effects, of course, that we live with today. But by the time I joined the market and the sort of museum world, you know, millennials were the ones who were supposedly not buying or paying attention. And I was, I, I couldn't disagree more. I think that Millennials and now Gen Z are both sort of raucous, eclectic, open-minded generations that, that largely haven't been exposed to historic material that much. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's, they're not like re re rejecting the interiors they grew up in, like Gen X was. In fact, a lot of us grew up with restoration hardware. We're already sick of it. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's this incredible opportunity to both just sort of feed that interest, which you see expressed in fashion, in design, and also to sort of prepare those younger people to become buyers. Mm -hmm. the, the, there's like an economic observation here, which is that, as you know, in the art market, young people, people in their 20s, have never been the core buyers. Mm -hmm. People in their 30s and 40s haven't been the core buyers. You know, really core buyers are in their 50s and 60s, usually. Mm -hmm. So I, I say like both this generation has a great deal of interest and mm -hmm. there is a sort of unfair expectation placed on them to begin buying at a high level, really before any generation ever has been known to do so. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're still sort of queuing up the younger people to become a more important part of the market. But I think the interest is huge on the, the side of sort of politics and culture at large, there's also now more and more interest placed on history generally, including in um, contexts when we're, where we're discussing race, class, gender, and all of those discussions have an historical and an art historical background. Young people are fascinated by those topics. So, you know, whether we're talking about the market or whether we're just talking about interest, it's there, it's there. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if you're looking at it from a market standpoint, we just have to be patient because millennials and younger people are sort of uniquely unqualified to buy at a high level. They've, they've got to get houses first. You know, yeah. we're still a generation of, <laughs> you know, 40 year olds that don't, that don't own property yet, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I want to just add an asterisk though, and say that a lot of what I do, um, involves communicating that anyone can be a collector at any time under any conditions. And it really, you know, there's, that's a big topic, but net net, I'm, I don't think people should only collect the best of the best. I think they should collect what's interesting to them and what's interesting and to go on a journey of, of sort of finding their singular vision as a collector. And, you know, you can do that with seashells, with stones on the ground, with flea market finds. And if you're really training your eye, learning, engaging with dealers, engaging with museums, in, in doing your, do, engaged in private study, you're going to have to develop an, a, a unique kind of take that transcends market barriers. You know, mm -hmm. so like I want to be able to go into a flea market and find something great. I also, of course, want to go to the Winter Show or Masterpiece or Tafoff 
and know what I would be able want to buy if I could afford it. And, yeah. and so I encourage people to just all begin thinking like a collector immediately, even yeah. if you know that you can't buy at the top of the market, you'll find great things wherever you look, if you're focused on that. Yeah. Oh God, there was, there was so much in that answer that I'm just thinking like, which, 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 which. <laughs> um, but I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the, um, on, on just on the topic of this idea of sort of exposure and being able to start early, you know, now it's, it's never been a better moment for that because, you know, yeah. I know you found amazing things on eBay. I found amazing things on Gumtree and, and Facebook. I just bought like a, a lovely display cabinet on Facebook marketplace for 20 quid. That's this like gorgeous piece that all I need to do is read the one. And, you know, that is a totally different type of, you know, collecting. And um, that was literally just like a couple of days ago that I, that I got this. Congratulations. Good I'm find. I excited about it. It feels like such a, um, such a deal. And just, you know, and then like researching about, oh, what was this, you know, small, sort of East London manufacturer in the in the 50s that, that made, anyway, doesn't matter. But, you know, th this joy that you can have throughout your life and, and also with um, generation, you know, with, with our generations becoming, you know, more aware of sustainability and more aware mm -hmm. of all the things. I feel like, you know, collecting as a word, you know, in many ways, collecting as a word has been something that's a bit dirty. You know, it's been like a, you know, in yeah. later, um, it's been something that you can't actually engage with. But mm. it feels as though collecting needs to, I mean, it, it already is in some ways, you know, certainly with the work that you're doing and things like that, but it needs to, on a larger scale, kind of be reclaimed as this thing to be, um, be enjoyed and that is Agreed. just aspect of life. It isn't, it isn't something that is connected purely to yeah. elitist, uh, you know, pu purely to things that are outside of your budget. Anything, no. can, say, anything can be collecting. And now, you know, framing that I mean, collecting is really about owning objects that feel uh, that, that are sort of deeply rooted in history or just feel like they have a lot of life in them. I mean, it's, it's sort yes. of hard to sort of put a, put a word on it, but um, I mean, I've certainly been, you know, very inspired by just you know, going through Facebook marketplace and also from seeing um, things that my, that my, that my peers and that, and that people like you have and kind of restage. And so I wondered if you could, um, because I know you have some objects that we were going to, we were going to touch on. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, and then we can go on to some, yeah, some other topics after. Sure. So, so this guy is, you know, this is a portrait miniature that wow. I purchased on eBay and I, I think he was quite a good find. I love that he's wearing a turban, you know, you could just, you can imagine we, all of the sort of like romance that I imbue this with because I'm thinking of the grand tour and the dilettanti. Yeah. And, you know, I love that it's sort of a product of, of, a, of a sort of neoclassical movement, but it's also a little bit eccentric, uh, which is something that appeals to me. And I'll say that, you know, I got that on eBay. One of the trends in the past couple of years that I've been paying closer attention to during the pandemic are young dealers who were only operating on Instagram. Since, you know, since we're here in Instagram, it feels mm. appropriate to mention this. Um, and I've been finding so many interesting things on their accounts. And it's really a new way of dealing, you know, where you don't have a physical location, which is something that, that, that there's been a trend of sort of moving away from a shop front mm -hmm. since the recession. But it's always just been sort of an, it's been sort of a sad negative thing that there's not a brick and mortar presence for a lot of our favorite dealers. Um, this is a little bit different, you know, digitally native people operating exclusively on Instagram, maybe loving that they don't have to man a shop and using Shopify, you know, to facilitate the transactions and just really focusing on sourcing great material. Um, so eBay was the, place where I got that. I, I, more recently, I've been buying some things on Instagram. Um, and then this is I, I love this so much. A I watercolor I recently bought at auction. And from you know, it has some condition issues, which is one reason why it's affordable for me, you know, as a millennial, and I'm constantly looking for things like that, that, um, you know, that have integrity, and including like, the integrity of the material is mostly intact, 
but maybe there's like something about it that means it's not going to reach um, mm -hmm. the heights of the other material in an otherwise quite, um, you know, competitive auction. So I love this. I, I brought it out because this is 1806. And, you know, it's also a product of a, of a sort of neoclassical moment in mm -hmm. um, American and British history. But this is clearly um, an, the work of an untrained hand. And, you know, anyone who follows me on Instagram will know that I, I love that. And I, I particularly love when, some, when a sort of high style um, idiom is translated through an untrained hand or eye. And this is this is a great example of that. So, you know, those are two the, very, go oh, ahead. They're like, they're like a beautiful pendant together. The idea, you know, both from a kind of comparable-ish date, both sort of with this eccentricity, you know, with this, yeah, depicting, I, I assume real people. I mean, clearly the portrait is a real person. I assume that the other scene is, you know, it looks like a cute sort of family interior. Um, and yeah, yeah, gorgeous. Can we see the miniature it, again? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Isn't he lovely? Yeah, he's just so, he's so gorgeous. I think I and, saw that when you first bought it, maybe. I think you might have shared it. And I was, yeah, just I, I did. Over. I actually, I, this is before I knew you. And I immediately went onto eBay and Googled. I just sort of searched on eBay to be like, hi, I wonder what kind of options they have for portrait. Because I've had quite a long thing of just loving portrait miniatures. And when I was a kid, I, I had some as sort of, when I was like eight, I got some as a birthday present. <laughs> that were what's yeah they're so accessible they're so accessible and it's like you know also with like porcelain for example there's such an active culture of dealing in it on ebay and other marketplaces that are rather humble that yeah. i feel like it's like dipping into the old world market even though we're discussing online marketplaces you know because there was a time too when you could go into the back of a shop and look at a bunch of old masters drawings and, and sort of pick your favorite and go home and frame it. You know, we don't live in that world anymore for a lot of the yeah. material we love, you know, it's so known to the market. It's never going to come back down to that, um, that sort of like discovery price. But anyway, there's certain types of material that still live at that level and you can find gems and someone actually just asked if, um, digital dealers physically possess the items or are they just acting as intermediaries? And I can just say that the, the ones I'm talking about are, they do have, they're, they're in possession of the material which they have sourced from, you know, various um, uh, contexts, including auctions, probably fairs, places in the US, places like Brimfield and often you know, what they're doing is cleaning those objects up, photographing them beautifully, and kind of giving them new life by reinterpreting them in this shiny Instagram context. But yeah, so, so the, there's an element of marketing in what they're doing and kind of polishing things up that I, act, that I think is helpful. It, it can help someone who's not used to looking at that type of material, see it through fresh eyes and see how it might work in their apartment or in their house. Yeah. But. Yeah, we also had another question of, of uh, asking if you knew who your portrait was of. I oh, if, I don't. I do. That. I have. I, I don't. There, there are active research projects uh, going on around every object that I buy. Um, and I have, I think I told you about another a watercolor I showed you, Izzy, that I had sort of completed the research on that has a fascinating, his, fascinating history. But these are, these are new to me. So that begins now, <laughs> finding out who they are. Um, there was a comment yeah, that, yeah, wonderful. Um, there was another, if, oh, go. oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say that it, it's, no, our not, friends, always, our it's friends, not necessary. Oh, delay. There's a lie. So, <laughs> please. We've got uh, it. You were I'll saying see. it's not necessary to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were saying it's not necessary to always know exactly. who's in a portrait, and I and I totally agree. I think that we're in a moment when a lot of people are surfacing portraits that have not received a lot of attention in the past, 
because maybe they're not examples of technical mastery. Um, but there's now more curiosity about the sitter, whether it's a person of color or a woman or a servant, mm -hmm. someone who would not have been sort of privileged um, in the art historical lenses that were used in the 20th century. And in those cases, I think it's, it's, it's really important to conduct the research to find out who people were. But there's still going to be mysteries, right? Because history always um, comes packaged with mystery as well as knowledge. Um, yeah. Aronson, uh, our friends at Aronson, the world's preeminent dealers of Delft um, have commented that, you know, dealers who are operating online are um, not evolving their businesses without sort of investing more in a physical location, et cetera. And I would just say that my dream is for all antiques dealers and art dealers to have brick and mortar locations again. I twisted mm -hmm. the arm of a friend who um, about two years ago opened what is now the only um, folk art gallery in the city. There used to be dozens, now, now there's one. And I really believe um, that art does need to be encountered in person to be fully understood and appreciated. These dealers that I was describing are, are very young. And so my hope is that they can take their businesses out into the world someday. Um, but we're living in a hybrid environment, you know, all of us. So there are going to be developments in the digital sphere and the physical sphere, and, and we'll see how it all plays out after the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's and very exciting, you know, seeing this world develop, seeing it develop with the kind of rise of the internet being sort of at the forefront of a lot of this, but also this real craving. I mean, I certainly have a craving for, for in-person oh, experiences yes. of art. You know, the couple of weeks for me being being, um, being abroad, you know, in, in, in Spain and just going to all these wonderful churches. I mean, I miss this, you know, and just, yeah, some things start to open up again when it's safe to do that. People will really want that. But I wanted to ask you about, because you mentioned the political nature, the, the way that younger people are getting engaged with historic objects because of the political aspects mm -hmm. of them. And you did a really great, uh, you wrote a really great pamphlet that was shared very widely over Instagram about the discussions around Confederate monuments. And, you know, those mm. are, of course, very overly political. Um, but the political spreads in many different ways around you know, historic objects in general. So I wondered, could you talk a little bit more about that pamphlet and also about, you know, and then we can maybe uh, think about sort of less kind of overtly political objects, but how they've also, how they're also changing shape. Of course, yeah. I, I, I'm from the American South and have always been troubled by the presence of Confederate monuments. And, you know, by their, by their physical presence in public spaces, but also, and perhaps in particular, by the lack of interpretation around them. You know, so I grew up in a town in which there's a Confederate monument in the courthouse square. And, and even to this day, there's no plaque that fully contextualizes what it was about. So I'll bracket the discussion about, you know, completely eliminating Confederate monuments or even destroying them. That's a sort of separate conversation that I don't have a lot of perspective on as an historian and preservationist, but as, as a sort of like baseline insight, I wanted to share ideas about how Confederate monuments could be reinterpreted and recontextualized and moved so that we can have public spaces that are welcoming to everyone today and then also give us a full rendering of of our history so i was really happy when it gained attention and it's it's taught it's been taught this year in 40 universities as as sort of like one example of um a preservation approach to confederate monuments but, you know, as with so many conversations over the past year in the wake of George Floyd's murder, um, there are, it, it's swiftly evolving, you know? And, and so I'm now once again, sort of uh, just, just sort of watching the conversation unfold and marveling at all of the different perspectives that are being shared at a rapid rate, you know? I mean, history is really top of mind in our society right now. And I think that's a great thing. In the context of 
um, like historic material culture, something I've been talking about for years is that we often look at objects through the lens of their consumption. So high style material being consumed by wealthy people in the 18th century or the 19th century. And I actually think art historical studies have done a lot to reinforce the sort of conspicuous consumption view of material yeah. culture and art, which I completely object to. And it's one of the reasons, I'm going to get a bit salty here. It's one of the reasons I, I did sort of leave um, academia. I, I really want, to, and, and now I understand how I could have reoriented my studies. Um, but at the time I was just so frustrated with this view that was sort of all insistently looking at consumption and being critical of it instead mm -hmm. of thinking about craft and making. So if we take New York as an example, we mm -hmm. could talk about how the Van Rensselaer family commissioned, uh, uh, you know, suites of high style furniture, or we could talk about the workshops where that furniture was produced and we could refocus our gaze mm -hmm. on you know, it's the, the people who made that furniture. And, you know, in New York, to give one example, furniture and upholstery workshops in the late 18th and early 19th century had a lot of black makers. And so I want to know about them. It's not necessarily a happy, shiny history, but there's a, there's a history of production. There's a labor history and there's a history of craft that gets obscured when we only focus on you know, how things were consumed. So long story short, I think that finally we're beginning to, yes, think critically, you know, we're thinking critically still about the consumption of, of art and material culture. But I think that a lot of people are thinking now about who made the stuff that we love, especially in the context of the decorative arts. And, and the answer is not the Van Rensselaers. They were not making that stuff. <laughs> I'm really excited to yeah, to craft more. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I can't agree with sort of the deep rooted uh, obsession in our history of the of the sort of pat patron of, of that of that relationship constantly being the patron of the collector. I mean, collecting, in, you know, is a fascinating, is a fascinating topic. It's, you know, it's about the lens through which one looks at it. It's about of our uh, sort of access and whether you're looking at the maker, whether you're looking at the patron, whether you're looking at the societal context, the, you know, ways in which it interacts with arts. I mean, you were talking right at the beginning of this about how you kept being drawn to the other arts, academic work. You know, I, I almost never sort of think about the sort of conspicuous consumption side or the patron side. But so much more of it is about the linking with the other sort of, with the other sort of cultural moments that are going on and with the entire sort of milieu and with the entire sort of in that, in that moment. And objects themselves, but that's, it's the ways in which we approach them. And in some ways that's, well, that's, one of the main reasons why why art and, and also sort of endlessly exciting and fascinating because we can always you know we can always see them through a different lens yeah precisely and in terms yeah. of yeah i mean something that we we talked about a little bit um before, and we haven't really touched on is this um is the sort of politicizing of, of collecting itself because that is also mm. something of maybe preconceptions. I mean, there are some very right, uh, correct perceptions of collecting, um, but those can't be in a, in a blanket, in a blanket way. And I think the Sewn is one, is an example of quite an unusual collection for the audience that might not know very much about it. You know, we talked about this before, that it is this sort of over the top, lavish, you know, creme de la creme style of collecting comparable to the Wallace. Um, but it's not, it's a very different kind of approach to collecting. And so since you are uh, so deeply immersed in the Sewn world, I wonder if you can, yeah, chat a bit about that. Yes, I mean, the Sewn Museum was, has always been my favorite place in London. And I used to visit it sort of ritualistically as this temple-like setting to regain my bearings during my studies in London and when I worked there. 
And so the opportunity of being, you know, working every day in the Sonian world was just a, a dream come true and has been a dream come true for me. I, I just couldn't agree more that the that Sohn's collection, his collecting practice, the way he designed for his, to, to facilitate, uh, to hold his collection is one of the most exciting expressions of this sort of singularity of vision that you can attain when you really care about objects, think about them and kind of collect for the right reasons out of curiosity, mm -hmm out of a really particular aesthetic vision that you cultivate over a long period of time. And in the case of the Sohn Museum, as we've discussed, you know, what we see today is Sohn's home and museum that he created over many years. And one of his, his purposes in setting up the space in the way that it's set up was to facilitate teaching and learning. And so, you know, he was he was giving lectures at the Royal Academy and then opening his space before it was a formal museum to students to come and study, you know, the plaster casts and other other, um, you know, examples of material culture and drawings that he had collected there. And so it's sort of a learning laboratory from the get go, which I find fascinating. You know, there's a real there was a deep rationale in um, related to, to kind of education that maybe we don't think about mm -hmm. so much today. And because his drawing office was also there, his staff were being exposed to the same examples of design, you know, and, and being inspired by them every day in the space in which they worked. So I find that a very exciting perspective on the museum. And, you know, Sohn also just had the most fabulous and eccentric ideas about what he was doing that sort of only grew more specific and personal and fantastical um, as, as his practice matured. But, you know, there's even a text that describes uh, a sort of future traveler visiting the museum and not really knowing how it came to be. And that person is thinking through who must have created and dwelled in these spaces. And so they're imagining a monk and an architect and, and these sort of like archetypes who must have been participating in the creation of this space. And it's all just a fantasy. Of course, it was, it was Sohn's fantasy. But I think we have so much to learn from that approach to being yeah. just sort of infinitely specific in how we create our dwellings and how we um, live with objects. Yeah, and, and while, you know, something that I found, you know, growing up in London, going to the Sony a, a great deal, it was always one of my, of my favorites, particularly as, as a kid, because there's this feeling of, you know, it's, it's like you're going through a jungle of objects, particularly when you're around, so really slightly higher up and you can't see around the corners. And, you know, you have all of these amazing pasts and then the sort of tomb of Seti mm. and all of this. Um, I, yeah, I found it totally mesmerizing. And so much more, I, I mean, as much as I love sort of classic museums as well, there's something, there's something immediately engaging about being in a space where you really feel that someone sort of lived, however, however different that person is from you, you know, how eccentric or this, this immediate feeling of, um, of closeness objects. And I think that one thing that museums have, have done, that there's sort of the classic hang of a museum, where it's, you know, you just have paintings on a wall and things on plinths, is remove them from that feeling of yes. ultimate, intimate connection. And it's something that I didn't really think too much about before uh, I then started working at the Wallace. And actually, as soon as I started at the Wallace, while the Wallace isn't a perfect, um, recreation of a home, there is something about the sort of about the, the way in which the furniture and the porcelain and everything interacts. I mean, there are no plinths in the walls, really, and there's, there's this feeling of yeah. semi well, you know, while people walk around and, and self to live in a home, like how then it's, it's somehow immediately intimate.
immediately and i think that stone is like that on mm. kind of on steroids <laughs> because it is still it is still someone's home or you know it, it was someone's home for a long time it was really used in this in this educational way um, yeah and each generation um, finds and something new that, to appreciate you know, a, a lot that, that sorry there was a bit of a delay i'll wait for it to settle Go, go ahead. Well, yeah, I was just saying that each generation finds something oh. new to be inspired by at the Wallace, at the Frick in New York, at the Stone Museum. A lot of modernists, a lot of modern architects were inspired by Stone and by the sort of architectonic um, expression that you can find in the museum. But today, when there's so much interest in interpreting museum galleries in a different, new, more engaging way. I think the Sewn Museum has a, a lot to say to curators and designers who are thinking about all of these questions of display that, um, that every museum is engaged in. Which, so I, anyway, I think it's like, it's, there's always, it, it, the museum is so rich and, and full of um, intrigue that you can always sort of pick out something else to be inspired by, but you know, just a last th thought about kind of collecting in the lives of younger people. Collecting, when it's a dirty word, is about conspicuous consumption, right? And it's about, and, and on the negative, uh, in the world of negative connotations around collecting, you can also move towards hoarding. You can move towards all sorts of kind of <laughs> negative associations. But I think that intentionality is something we should focus on more. So if I had a completely empty apartment here, but I had two or three small historic objects that were very meaningful to me, I would, I would think of myself still as a collector. You know, I've collected three things that, that have a deep resonance in the space that I'm fascinated and inspired by. And I think that that's enough. That is enough to, to qualify someone as a collector also, I don't think of that as minimalism. You know, if someone has a completely empty apartment, but the, the three things they have, even if they're tiny, are sort of like expressions of culture and style and, and history that are kind of infinite in their meaning, that's not minimalism. So I just, I like getting away from the sort of shallow definitions that give people false ideas about what we're doing in the art world and thinking about like, what are the deeper roots here? And for me, collecting just means whether you have two things or 2000 things that you're doing it with, with intention and, and sort of expressing yourself and developing your understanding of the world through it, you know? I couldn't agree more. And I feel like that's the perfect place. I've just looked at the time we've been here for 55 minutes. <laughs> I feel like that's the perfect place to kind of round off because, you know, the it's sort of bring nuance into this, you know, everyone says, oh, nuance is dead, but it's not, you know, when you, when you love objects and when you love sort of complexity and everything like that, that's what you're bringing into your, into your life. So, um, yeah, I, Indeed. that was so beautifully said and, and Michael, so much for this discussion, for your insights. It's been incredibly fascinating for me. And, and I hopefully for, for the audience too, we've getting loads of, loads of uh, hearts coming up the side from, from people who seem to have really enjoyed it. And everyone for watching. And Michael, come to London soon. Um, the city misses you. <laughs> but until then, have a great time. Oh, thank you, Izzy. And, and you're, I can't wait to have a martini with you in New York as well. We'll do it on both sides of the sea. And... Um, thank you to the Athena Art Foundation, whose mission I think is spot on. Uh, may we all engage more and more deeply with historic art and material culture. Have a great day, everyone. Exactly. And this, and this whole live, if you didn't manage to watch the whole thing, uh, this is going to be up on the Athena Art Foundation uh, Instagram very soon. So go follow them and, and you